Paris is best known for its splendid districts and exquisite sights. And yet on the outskirts of the French capital there are environs far less attractive. Indeed, in these outer suburbs there are residential zones whose architecture can elicit feelings of depression and anxiety. Fortunately, in Patrick Blanc's vision of vertical gardens, there is finally a solution for these ugly, densely populated districts whose every square meter is prohibitively expensive. His provocative model represents a realistic alternative to the present blight of stony sadness. Here in blanc mesnil for example, once barren walls have now been opulently clothed in floral frescoes. Located in Créteil, a suburb of Paris, Patrick Blanc's residence persuasively demonstrates that one truly can give the dreary grey city a green facelift. Located only a few streetcar stops from an encroaching cluster of sterile skyscrapers is the private jungle and home of the tropical botanist. And provided Blanc is not off on one of his sojourns, regular expeditions into the tropical rainforests, he can be found here, living in a private oasis with his friend, the singer and composer Pascal Eni. Patrick Blanc, who is among the world's most distinguished tropical botanists, manages to find time for careers both as a bird of paradise and as a working artist. Indeed, he's able to use the specialized knowledge he has gained as a scientist in his artistic endeavors. The concept underlying the plant wall had its genesis in Blanc's aquarium. As a child, he discovered that philodendron could grow in water. In time, he came to understand that plants require no soil whatsoever to grow. After years of testing, he developed his patented method, Mur Végétaux, living plant walls. His apartment and its courtyard served as the testing ground for his ideas. Despite the complete absence of soil, one finds on Blanc's plant walls shrubs whose stems are the thickness of an arm. The vertical plant beds find their sustenance in the felt covering of the wall's construction. The resulting floral tapestries are reminiscent of the jungle themes in the artwork of the French master Henri Rousseau. And while Rousseau's paintings were dominated by enormous plants, Blanc's artwork, though similar in spirit, emphasizes a variety of forms. Binding the work of these two artists across the centuries is their common love for the boundless richness of the jungle. Patrick Blanc's passion is not for traditional gardens. His heart belongs to the jungle. I've never particularly cared for gardens. Okay, I have a garden here, but I don't really regard this as a garden. For me, this is just a planting bed where I can experiment, where I can keep all those plants that interest me. And that's altogether different from a garden in the traditional sense, by which I mean a garden where everything is formally structured. And then it remains like that forever, which is terrible. That's the most hideous thing I can imagine with a garden that everything is fixed in position and you know exactly how it will develop. That's absolutely nothing to do with the way a natural ecosystem operates. Such an approach to gardening doesn't interest me in the least. I much prefer a tropical jungle. Since I was 18 or 19, these wild forests have been my true home. For me, they are the only genuine gardens. I'm trying to recreate these jungles here, of course, within my limited possibilities. But I would never describe my work as gardening or this as a garden. Until now, the majority of Blanc's plant walls could only be found in and around Paris. The climate of the French metropolis is marked by mild winters and a lengthy spring. Ideal conditions for Blanc's plant walls, which must often serve as a living evergreen facade. Such conditions are also found at Place Abbesse in Montmartre where Blanc has recently fashioned plant walls for the roof garden of a German-French family.
For the composition of this plant wall, Patrick Blanc drew from indigenous as well as exotic plant species. By carefully choosing a wide spectrum of plant varieties, the wall's flowers and shrubs will variously be in bloom from early spring on through late autumn. The vertical orientation of the plant walls as well as their ingenious composition provide an optimal and efficient use of precious urban space. Thus, in the middle of the hyperkinetic city, one can find quiet green oases occupying remarkably limited confines. In 1994, Patrick Blanc made his first public presentation of the plant walls in chaumont sur loire Since 1992, a world-renowned garden festival has been hosted here upon the grounds of the Palace Park. Each year, 30 internationally celebrated garden artists are invited to create temporary displays according to a given motto, as, for example, erotic gardens. Featured on permanent display in the southernmost corner of the park are highlighted works selected as the finest examples of each year's showings. Among these are three of Patrick Blanc's plant walls. The secret of their construction, well hidden behind the plant tapestry, is a tubular steel frame. This frame serves both as a kind of scaffolding and as a spacer keeping the construction away from the wall or facade it covers. This effectively prevents the moisture of the plant wall from affecting the undersurface. Onto the metal framework are mounted synthetic plates covered in water-storing felt. Sewn onto this are the felt sacks in which the plants grow. Irrigation is achieved by hidden perforated garden hoses. This system is governed by an automatic timer which ensures that both watering is regular and that the nutrient supplements are timely delivered. In chaumont sur loire alone, Blanc has tested out more than 400 different varieties of plant species in the composition of his plant walls. Over time, the list of the plants I work with has become more refined. Slowly but surely I'm learning which plants thrive with a northern orientation and which prefer southern, eastern or western. And I've learned which plants do best at the foot of the wall, which is always the wettest part. Further up the wall, you find plants that prefer conditions similar to those growing on exposed rocky cliffs. Plants like Budlia, Cotoniaster or Lonicera. The further down you go, the more you find a protected environment where the felt always remains damp. Here you'll find mosses covering everything. All in all, I let myself be guided by the surroundings in which the plants grow in nature. Fortunately, the plants are often far more robust than I expect, and a plant will thrive in a place I never would have expected or a plant that you just know will do well doesn't grow at all. And of course, that's all right too. But generally speaking, I don't experience many bad surprises. In 1997, Patrick Blanc created the Valley of Fog in chaumont sur loire Artificially generated fog lends the small shady ravine a mysterious aura. Most striking in the Valley of Fog is Blanc's preference for plants capable of growing in flowing rivulets. Plants imported from northern Japan and China are of particular interest to the botanist, as they are likewise capable of surviving European winters. Many of these are common plants such as ginger and nettle. Blanc is especially fond of the beautiful leaf forms on the non-stinging nettle species Bohemeria trichospecis.
Patrick Blanc is a true 21st century plant hunter. Housed in the park of Vallée aux Loups, Blanc has amassed the largest collection of climbing and flowering vine species in the world. More than 300 varieties are displayed in his greenhouses here. The vast majority were collected during Blanc's many research journeys in Europe and abroad, albeit as a kind of side study, because Blanc's actual specialty is in jungle underbrush. The balance of the plants on display were obtained by trading with colleagues and cultivators. This collection is sustained by the government of Haute de Seine for two reasons. In addition to their purely scientific value, it's hoped that garden fans may be offered the broadest spectrum of climbing species. As for Patrick Blanc, he treasures these plants above all else for their unique biological qualities. The fascinating thing about these plants is, they are in every way opposite to the plant species which grow in the underbrush. Those types of plants grow very slowly because they have to adapt to the inadequate light and water conditions. These plants, on the contrary, will grow virtually anywhere. There, where woods have been deforested, they spring up into the heights. Everywhere in cities, they'll be seen climbing up latticework fences. They're simply everywhere. And more than that, their lives have an unbelievably quick rhythm. In English, many varieties are called morning glory because they bloom in the morning and then remain in blossom for a number of hours. Later in the evening, they close up. That's a truly fast pace of life, quite different from the thin plants which make up the underbrush and which are the usual object of my studies. I find this contrast simply fascinating. Blanc has named his most beautiful discoveries after great female singers of the 20th century. Sarah Leander, Edith Piaf and Eartha Kitt. And nevertheless, despite the beauty of these magical flowers, Patrick Blanc's greatest love is reserved for a plant of an altogether different sort. The plants I prefer above all others are the very same plants which, when I was only about 12 years old, were the objects of my first love. These are the cryptocorinon water plants, which are most often found in creeks in Malaysia, Thailand, Sumatra and Borneo. It was these plants that motivated my first trip to the tropics when I was 19. Since then, every time I travel again to Asia, I try to spend some time photographing and simply observing cryptocorinon. For a long, long time, they've been my very favorite plant species. While on an expedition to Chile, Patrick Blanc's principal interest was in plant life found in and along flowing waters. Blanc's comprehensive knowledge of the relationship between plants and water formed the scientific basis for construction of a garden in Mairie sur Oise. Together with landscape architects Pascal Cribier and Lionel Guibert, Blanc developed an experimental garden for the Vivendi Universal Group. Based upon Blanc's scientific conceptions, the team designed a display garden whose compositional themes symbolize the diverse ways plants are dependent upon water. In Marie sur Oise, Patrick Blanc's plant walls grow upon surfaces of iron and lava rock. This element of the garden has as its central theme the morphology, that is to say the shape and structure of plant life. A begonia, for example, is made up of 99% water. It is therefore purely from a statistical point of view dependent for its survival on the irrigation hoses, which throughout the day release water droplets.
Patrick Blanc lives in a microcosm consisting almost solely of plants and music. Mes sources d'inspiration pour mes Obviously, my source of inspiration for the plant walls, indeed, for all of my plant creations, is found in nature. To be honest, I'm a rather uncultivated person, and I'm not saying this to try and show off or as some kind of pretense. I did, of course, have a university education. I gained a doctorate in science, and I'm a prize winner of the Academy of Sciences and all that. But when it comes to general knowledge, except for about singers and singing, I'm really limited. I don't read much, and I seldom go to the cinema. Je vais très peu au cinéma. Je lis évidemment en quantité de livres scientifiques, ça évidemment des publications. Naturally, I read an awful lot of scientific journals and books. But even when it comes to matters like design and art, I'm terribly ignorant. For many years now, I've had the pleasure of meeting and working alongside architects and designers on a regular basis, and that really is a lot of fun. But I honestly have no idea of how they do their work. I take my creations directly from nature and from no other source. Nature has inspired Patrick Blanc as well in composing the text to Idylle Chlorophyllienne, which is interpreted by his friend Pascal Eni. J'aime bien ma vie sans soleil, protégé dans les moiteurs mais j'aime dans mon être ce rocher. Je veux le visiter, mais j'ai un peu peur. Je lui ai dit je t'aime, il m'a dit quand même, tu pourrais goûter ma minéralité. Une éclaboussure portera la graine que j'aime l'idylle, chlorophyllienne. Recently, Patrick Blanc's professional services have included excursions into Parisian high fashion. This evening dress, for example, is his joint creation with Jean-Paul Gaultier. For each new plant creation, the first step is to draft a detailed planting scheme. Patrick Blanc's plan must account for differences in the lighting conditions as well as in the varying water use needs of the different plant species. Moreover, Blanc must pay particular attention to the potential for interaction among the species. Because in a vertical garden, plants grow interspersed with each other, there exists a remarkably close relationship between the selected species. In the Parisian suburb of Blanc-Mesnil, Patrick Blanc has brought green life to the interior and exterior of the municipal cultural center. A thick, rich tapestry of plant life adorns the entrance hall and the first floor of the building. As these areas are within a heat-controlled environment, Patrick Blanc used the opportunity to introduce plants from diverse tropical and subtropical regions. This composition lends the building an exotic flair on even the saddest and greyest of days. And despite the ever-changing climate of the unprotected courtyard, the plant wall Blanc has created there easily withstands comparison with his interior plant walls, both as to variety and luxury of composition. Both are in fact complex compositions and true floral paintings. The reaction of people to my plant walls is very often just how people would respond to a traditional work of art, such as a painting or a tapestry. And what exactly does that ultimately mean? It means that the viewer comes into direct and close contact with the complete global structure, because the position of my plant walls is parallel to the position of the viewers. People stand upright, just as my plant walls do. They are designed to face us directly. Consequently, we have a complete view, and as a result we view them as we would a painting. And what fascinates me is how an individual viewer's focus of attention might be drawn upward, sideward or downward, depending on that viewer's own particular sensibilities. This is not the case at all with the work of a landscape architect, because his work is restricted to a horizontal plane. 
So it's the decision of the landscape architect where a viewer's attention will be drawn and focused. In contrast, with my plant walls, I give the viewer complete freedom to choose, according to his own fancy, where he will invest his interest and attention. Freedom is a fundamental concept for Patrick Blanc. But liberty is not only granted to observers of his vertical gardens who are free to choose their own focus and perspective. For example, here in the Bologna Biancourt shopping arcade, Blanc has granted the plants themselves the freedom to grow without apparent limits or boundaries. But Patrick Blanc's design is only seemingly based upon casual controls. In fact, more than any other person, he knows the specific needs and growth patterns of the various species down to their finest details. Consequently, his green paintings are painstakingly developed from both an aesthetic and pragmatic point of view. And Blanc's artistry is not limited to the composition of living frescoes. Even more impressive is his ability to create perfectly balanced ecosystems in the most unlikely places. On a side street off the Champs-Élysées, Patrick Blanc has now created his most ambitious project. The green transformation of the inner courtyard of the posh hotel Pershing Hall. The interior of the building was the work of internationally celebrated designer André Putman. And it was she who invited Blanc to take on the project. In Paris's 8th district, Patrick Blanc has created a perfect symbiosis of culture and nature. Here in the capital city chic centre, he has imported a tropical jungle which now adorns a 30 meter high wall. But it is not alone the enormity of the plant wall that astonishes the hotel's guests. It is rather the variety and living nature of the artwork which engender feelings of respect and wonder in those who view it. Patrick Blanc has truly set a new standard for the green beautification of a city. This plant wall was built with an almost unlimited budget, lending us a glimpse of the potential future scope of Blanc's work. Fortunately, I haven't always worked in such luxurious circumstances. I've also made things for much more problematic areas, but wherever I work, I always enjoy the proximity to the plants. Since plants are vertical, just as we are, there's an extremely lively interaction, a dialogue between us. And let's not forget, plants have a very calming effect, especially when they're encountered in such a mass of different varieties. I'm convinced that the road to a secure future lies in this cooperation between the plants and humanity. Collaboration entre les plantes et l'homme. Patrick Blanc's vision is very concrete. For him, it comes down to designing apartments, housing tracts, and entire towns more beautifully and more interestingly. The simplest residential districts could profit greatly from such a basic goal. Given the choice, Blanc would begin with the new residential districts of his own town, Crete. Thanks to Patrick Blanc's research, the knowledge and technology exist for the construction of vertical gardens. A warm tropical breeze can now be felt in the cold concrete jungles of our modern cities. And as long as Patrick Blanc's plants grow, so shall the quality of our lives. Mm.